Welcome everyone uh, to the International Philosophy Talk series held by the Department of Philosophy at Marmara University, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, today we are honored to have with us uh, Professor Francisco D.C. Beretarbide from University of Thurlos III of Madrid. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the International Philosophy Talk. Thank Sorry you. about that. My <laughs> the YouTube uh, connection got uh, active and you heard my voice again. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, if I was to talk about Professor Lizzy Bertabides' publications and his accomplishments, I guess it would take perhaps half of the talk, uh, maybe an hour or so. So please uh, pardon me when I give only a brief uh, introduction. Um, pro Professor Francisco Lizzy Bertabides' main research interests are the classical political theory and its reception mainly in contemporary political theory. The history of Platonism, including philosophy of Alexandria, Cicero's philosophical works, Plotinus, etc. At present, his main objects of research are an annotated translation into Spanish of Proclus's The Elements of Theology and of works by Marinus of Neapolis. He is also concerned with an edition for the Bibliotheca Classica Tumneriana of Plato's Laws and a translation into Spanish and commentary of Aristotle's politics. He is an emeritus professor of the University Thurlos III of Madrid in Spain and a former director of the Institute of Classical Studies of Lucio Anio Seneca of the same university. Today's talk is entitled Plato and Tyranny, a Nietzschean reading of Plato's political texts and their impact in Nietzsche. So once again, please join me in welcoming Professor Lizzy Bertarbide. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and for your introduction. I have uh, chosen this, uh, I think, new reading of Plato's uh, philosopher, King, and his, uh, its uh, relationship with uh, the Nietzschean and the modern notion of, uh, contemporary notion of leadership. Because I think this is one of the points that are not very good understood in Plato's political theory. As a starting point, I would like to clarify the meaning of the subtitle. By a niche, niche and reading, I do not intend to give an image of what Nietzsche thought about Plato's relationship to tyranny, although this could be a very interesting subject. I will only play a very indirect role in, in this paper, in fact, I do not remember many passages in Nietzsche's work where he considers Plato's view of tyranny. Rather, I will point to some continuities in the development of Western political thought and to the dangers that these bundles of ideas represent for Western civilization and for every civilization. With bundles, I refer to combinations of ideas, concepts, or notions that are connected to a central concept and that form part of a bigger complex of arguments that in a certain moment in history become decisive in human political action. They do not necessarily play a central role in the original group of argument. The notions belonging to the bundle can originally exist separately for centuries and later become casually united. They can keep on sleeping for centuries until they occupy the center of the scene and become, become violent. It is undeniable that there are continuities in Western political thought that have their origin in Greece. 
They are also, there is also no doubt that in spite of Nietzsche's well-known criticism of Plato's position in the history of philosophy, he is much more indebted to Plato's political philosophy than generally accepted. It suffices to read the final remark in the preface of the, as you have on the screen, the, the text in the preface of the Griechische, the Griechische Staat, which I have put on the screen in order to give you a very concise but clear feeling of his depth to the Greek's thinker. Freely, his vision of Plato is influenced by the idea of genius, which is more proper in the 19th century than of Plato's philosophy. This implies, implies excuse me, among other things, to give, to give to artists, and in particular to us, artists with genius, a position that Plato would never have accepted. Nevertheless, Nietzsche is not the only thinker who exercises his, these projections of his coeval context in the Platonic test. Something similar could be said about other political movements, such as populism, democratic tendence, tendencies, or philosophers as Leo Strauss or Hannah Arendt, just to name only these two. On the other side lies the well known love of all. I, underline of all total, total, totalitarianism for one or the other aspect of Plato's political philosophy. However, it could perhaps be more significant to find out in which way Plato's influence Nietzsche and Nietzsche influenced Plato's image in the 20th century. This formulation should be corrected or rather more precisely formulated, in which way the 19th century image of Plato influenced Nietzsche's thought and Nietzsche's image of Plato, of Plato influenced the political thought of the 20th century in a recently published collective volume of on Nietzsche's influence on the conservative revolution, whatever that by, may be, mean, there is no favor related to this issue. The broad impact of classical political philosophy in the 20th century has its historical, its historical uh, foundation in the argument of authority. When you approach to an ancient text, it is practically impossible not to project on it our contemporary way of thinking. Our contemporary questions, which quite probably do not correspond to the questions to which the text sought to give an answer. This limitation is a hermeneutical prejudgment which determines a certain positive or negative reading according to contemporary criteria. Every political party or ideological group likes to find in the great personalities of the past the, especially if they are weak, a confirmation for their ideas. This influence on their interpretation changes at time gradually and at time abruptly with fashions of political and political circumstances. This is especially true today thanks to the mass media and the invite the evasion of simplifying journalism in all areas of our life. Since the end of the 
second world war. I hope you can see relatively good the pictures and the on the screen, or at least read them. Yeah, they are just a little bit small, uh, but uh, okay. we can see. Moment, I, I would like to theoretically I put no. Okay, it's not. Uh, I believe if we, if uh, it's a good event. Okay, okay, okay. Wait a minute. Uh, we have. Uh, if the audience uh, can enlarge this screen, uh, I'm sure they will be able to see it. So. Um, okay, okay. I know that because I can. Perhaps it's that's not so nice. Our better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good, excuse me. I said, uh, since the end of the Second World War, the issue of the relation between freedom and power has also been one of the recurrent things in contemporary political theory especially because of the experience with the defeated and still existing totalitarianism. Excuse me, I have a problem. I have a problem with the PowerPoint. I don't know, he's going out. Oh, yeah, very <laughs> so, Abruptly, I don't know why. Wanted to verify it for some reason, I guess. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, perhaps it's the problem with the. Could I I I I follow without. This is from. Without PowerPoint. Okay. It's the end of the Second World War. Uh, the issue of the relationship between uh, power, freedom and power has been, excuse me, I again tying with the... Now uh, it's okay, uh, yeah. yes. Um, when, but, uh, I'm... I'm Start again in the paragraph. Okay. Since the end of the Second World War, the issue of the relation between freedom and power has also been one of the recurrent things in contemporary political theory, especially because of the experience with the defeated and still existing totalitarianism and the reference to classical political power. Today, Conscious of the hermeneutical limitations outlined above, I shall undertake to present a literary interpretation of a selection, selection of passages of creative dialogues without feeling myself compelled to defend a democratic interpretation of the Greek philosopher. And I'll try to compare afterwards with Nietzsche's conception and the impact briefly in the modern political modern political philosophy. Contrary to what the title could induce to believe, I shall not try to describe Plato's image of the tyrant, a very known issue, issue treated by people who are more able than me on the matter, a very known uh, on the matter, in fact, Plato does not say much about the tyrant on historical tyranny, except in the last part of the eighth and the first of the ninth book of the Republic. I will rather focus 
and the, on his counterfeit figure, the philosopher King, for reasons that my expose, I hope, will make evident. Among the, the testimonies which, which are, have been preserved from antiquity, Plato is the first who has theoretically elaborated the possibility of the of an absolute ruler. However, we know with certainty that a debate about the different political systems existed in Greece at least since Herodotus' time. We also know that according to Plato's testimony, the issue was one of the main subjects in the doctrines of the Sophists. Callicles in the Gorgias and Thrasymachus in the Republic defend points of view which could be related to philosophical currents that claim tyranny as the best form of government. Nevertheless, do their arguments express a systematic doctrine of, of or, or rather represent a particular answer in a heated discussion with Socrates. In other words, do their position depend on the dialogical situation? In Caliclus, it is not clear whether he is thinking about an absolute ruler or rather of a person who does not care about the existing norms, but imposes his will. We should not forget that the Greek word, word nomos has a much broader meaning than our term law. Apparently, Calliclis, Calliclis actually thinks of a person who does not worry about the realm morality. In Thrasymachus' case, the question of tyranny is still more inconclusive, although the majority of the scholarship believe that he was a supporter of tyranny. I think that Trasimachus does not support tyranny as the best form of government, but rather state a fact that a very ever that every political system imposes its own, own norms, something similar to Protagoras' point of view. A few preserved fragments, in my view, point of preserved fragments of Trasimachus fragments in my view, point in this direction. Much more important than the possible interpretation of both sophists whose figures are known through Plato's description is the fact that their positions and other texts show the importance of the issue. In fact, they reflect that, that there was a hot discussion about the figure of tyrants and value of tyranny of tyranny as a form of government. As a further hint to the intensity of the discussion can be used Xenophon's dialogue, dialogue Hero, in which Hero, the tyrant of Syracuse, maintains that the tyrant's life is not much happier than the life of a normal man. Another example of this controversy can be seen in Plato's Republic. From these and other testimonies, we can be certain that it was a central issue of the political discussion during the 5th and the 4th century BC. In fact, the horizon of the dispute is actually the problem of the relationship between power and social norm, that is, between law and politics, a very up-to-date topic. The different logoi which structure the Republic are organized around an axis, the opposition between the just and the unjust. The problem is formulated in a drastic way by Adamantus in the second book. I quote, there you can see the quotation on the screen. 
do not then merely prove to us in argument that justice is stronger and better than injustice, but show us what is is that each inherently does to its possessor, whether he does or does not escape the eyes of gods and men, where, whereby the one benefits him and the other harms him. This passage is the conclusion of a previous requirement of the Socrates demonstration had to show the intrinsic value of both justice and injustice without consideration of the external praises of material benefits. This approach is complemented by the implicit identification of the just man with the philosopher and the unjust one with the tyrant. The longest part of the dialogue is dedicated to the analysis of the philosopher. Through the analogy between the city and man, Socrates characterizes his nature and his nurture. The genetic consideration of the origin and structure of the state or political organized community allows Socrates to put the issue in a different level insofar as it opens the question of power. The community. The, com the community must fulfill the task for which it is most up. Yeah, every member of the community must fulfill the task for which he is most up. It's known the famous dictum ta heo tu pratri. The principle of division of work as basis of the structure of the state permits that the argument focuses on the selection of the suitable characters for the exercise of power. The class of guardians later from the second from the second later from the second part of the fifth book until the, until the end of the seventh the argument argument focuses on the most suitable character for the exercise of power. This part is introduced by Socrates. The next quotation, famous statement. Unless, said I, either philosophers become kings in our states or those with whom we now call our kings and rulers take to the pursuit of philosophy seriously and adequately, and there is a conjunction of these two things political power and philosophic intelligence, while the motley hold of the nature who are present pursue either intelligent and either apart from the other are compulsorily excluded, there can be no cessation of troubles, dear Glocken, for our states, nor I fancy for the human race either. Nor until it happens, Will this constitution which we have been expounding in theory ever be put into practice within the limits of possibility and see the light of the sun? But this is the thing that has made me so long shrink from speaking out, because I saw that it would be a very paradoxical saying, for it is not easy, easy to see how that there is no other way of happiness either for private or public life. This statement occurs in the so-called third wave, which according to Socrates will not be accepted and will make him the object of lotta and scorn. In this passage, Socrates connects knowledge, science, politics and philosophy, concepts which are opposed in real life. This is just the passage Nietzsche allude, alludes to in the Greek state. I have quoted before, the beginning of the lecture. 
However, Socrates adds some remarks that commentators today often ignore. He states that there are people who by nature are destined to philosophize and govern the city, while the rest must stay away from philosophy, from philosophy. Uh, and uh, wait for excuse me, philosopher, and follow the leader. He says, I quote, it will be possible to defend ourselves by showing that by their very nature, the study of philosopher and exercise of political leadership belong to them. While it befits the other sort to let philosophy alone in to follow their leader. Excuse me, I am. Yeah. This, this generally overseen sentence is extraordinarily significant. It clearly shows that for Plato, there is a natural disposition to philosophy, fuse, and that it existed already before the philosophical Pideria. Furthermore, it points the fact that it is necessary precondition, precondition for the practice of, practice of philosophy. Those who do not fulfill this condition should stay away from philosophy. This is not an isolated quotation. There are many others. This is a very important only on sixth book, 485A2 until A, for instance. But the question is now, what kind of nature is able to philosophize? The first step in the construction of Callipolis consists in the selection of suitable natures which could rule the city. They must hold their two inevitable characteristics for becoming a good statesman and a good philosopher. Temperance, sophistry, and courage, Andrea. Both are not virtues. Uh, those expressions of such qualities are virtue, but they are not still virtues. They are properties of their character, which we could better translate as softness or mildness and fierceness of aggressiveness. The long and complicated test to which the candidates must submit do not attempt to test their philosophical knowledge, but to confirm whether they have suitable natures for ruling the community. In fact, the last examination is scheduled five years after the completion of their education in order to obtain a final confirmation that the guardians concerned actually owned a suitable nature. A further precondition related to the guardian's nature is unlimited love to the, to the knowledge of the forms and the truth. The long disquisitions between the second half of the fifth book and the first half of the sixth, which is dedicated to differentiate true philosophers from their imitators, is concerned with this aspect. Plato's care with the innate characteristics of a genuine philosophical nature appears clearly in another passage of the sixth book, 487a to 5. It must have a good memory, memon, a quick and quick apprehension, to mathes. Furthermore, he must be magnificent. Megalopropes, friendly, friendly, Eucharist, 
and akin to true justice, courage, and temperance. Philos de Kai Singenes de Salefeas de Cayosines Andrea Socosino. It is evident that this extraordinary nature has a kinship and sungeneya with the virtue or a tie or better the excellence. In other words, this kinship exists before education. This is a principle of the similar, like similar. In general, this permanent issue of Plato's politics goes quite unnoticed, that is that the most important acts of politics is to select suitable men who are able to practice philosophy and to rule the city. The passage I have quoted above and about, okay. also shows another important point of Plato's thought. While the practice of philosophy is conceived as a multiplicity, uh, what, excuse me, this one. Uh, the, that is an activity between several persons, the exercise of the, uh, the exercise of power is conceived as an individual activity. Vegetti, in his commentary to the Republic and translation and commentary in Italian, into, has pointed to the fact that Plato always characterizes the philosophical rule as a kingdom and the philosophical ruler as a king. The absolute rule that the philosopher exercises is based in the first place on his extraordinary nature and only secondarily and his philosophical education, which alone cannot warrant the correct application of the acquired knowledge. We should not forget that Plato expressly refused that the highest knowledge can be acquired only through instruction. You need to hold a certain quality of character I, that is to own a certain nature. In another page, a passage of the seventh book, 435 A9 to B3, to B3, Socrates refers to the criteria applied to, in the selection of gardens in the second and third book it mentions that the pre-selection included the staunchest and most courageous character, who says, and as far as possible, those with best appearance, kai katadinmen to eu de status. Now, continues Socrates, before passing to the new stage, it is necessary to look for people who are the noblest and bravest but they must also show a nature which is suitable for the education they will acquire. The use of the word thesis in Plato's work is complex in the sense that it means that the final result is that the final result is also the final result of natural disposition and education, that is of law. <laughs> According to the Timaeus, humans have three kinds of soul. One is the mind, another is the will, and the third is passion. This conception is central for the understanding of the Republic because they are not a unity divided into three parts of, <coughs> of light plate of psychology is usually interpreted, but a dynamic whole or group and a dialectical relation of harmony when healthy and contradiction and war when sick. <coughs> Excuse me. The exercise of power in the Republic 
is periodic. It seems <coughs> that Plato has projected the periodic reinforcement of the rule of the weakest element in this dynamic relationship, the mind, the weakest element, the mind, the yes. In this way, he hoped to prevent the weakening produced by the continuous contact with the desires and miseries of the exercise of power. <coughs> some, some passages of the Lord also let us observe Plato's detachment from any form of philosophical intellectualism. Philosophical education is a necessary but not sufficient condition since it must be done on the basis of an original good nature. It only has the task of remembering what the soul already know, knew, excuse me, that is the anamnesis. The philosopher kings are extraordinary natures which are beyond humanity, like, like the queen of being, says Socrates explicitly in 420 B5 to 6. I quote, we have created rulers and king, as in the swarm of peace, according in the funeral ceremony. Swamps of peace, excuse me. Accordingly, in the funeral ceremonies in Honolulu, they receive after they were, they have are adored as divine spirits. If the pity give her approval, or as blessed and called life. I pass now to the second part of this lecture, namely the rule of the politician in the statesman. The dialogical, the dialogic situation in the political statesman is different from the setup of the Republic because the purpose and the definition of the statesman they are looking for is not to differentiate human uh, the two philosophers from the false ones, but this as in the sixth book, fifth and sixth book of the Republic, but to distinguish or it's in the true human politician from the God of the Kronos time and from his present competitor, elector, elected kings, priests, and their assistants, sophists, etc. The later, the later constitutes, the latter, excuse me, con constitutes a multifarious and changing collection on mass clearly delimited from true politicians. The guest from Ilia, the main interlocutor in the dialogue undertakes the distinction in the last part of the dialogue on the basis of the exclusive legitimacy of the two statesmen. He is the only one who can and must exercise the absolute power in the city. I think the identification of the politician of the statesman with the republic philosopher, republic's philosopher king cannot be, be seriously adopted. However, the statesman does not focus on the extraordinary nature of the philosopher, but on the way in which the he rules. He's the only one actually legitimated to enact law following, following the scientific principles he knows, in other words, it, Words, he stands above the law and may neither be controlled nor restricted by them. Nevertheless, and this is a point still resisting the scholarly interpretation, his human nature, albeit Obermann, he has a human nature, very specially 
but still human, compels him to enact laws for ruling. In this dialogue, Plato places the politician philosopher in an historical perspective. He is the leading light who, who takes the place of the divinity who led the human flock in the age of Kronos. The city and the present politicians are only imitation of the state of affair under, under the true politician. Sometimes they change the laws without the indispensable scientific, the actual politician, the scientific knowledge. Therefore, the absolute rule of law is the only correct policy for those who do not know, that who do not own the science of politics. The guest of Ilea if an historic, a historical explanation of the different political systems existing today, they emerge when human laws they trust in the philosopher King. That is the quotation you have now in the screen, on the screen. Thus, we say, the tyrant has arisen and the king and oligarchy and aristocracy and democracy because men are not contented with that one perfect ruler and do not believe that there could ever be any one worthy of such power or willing and able to be uh, by ruling with virtue and knowledge to dispense justice and equity rightly to all, but that he will harm a king and injure any one of us who he chose, chooses on any occasion since they admit that if such a man as we described should really arise, he would be welcomed and would continue to dwell, dwell among them directing, directing excuse me, to their will and soul rather as a perfectly right form of government. Of government. In this passage, the guest of Elia expressly states his belief in the historical reality of the philosophical rule. Taking the whole dialogue into account, we could guess or rather speculate that this historical age was located at the beginning of the age of Zeus, when human, after the initial chaos, had to create a new order. If I may keep on speculating, we could guess that the leaders of the different human flocks were elected by the leading gods them themselves before they abandoned the human flocks. Something similar is alluded in the critics. The kernel of this way of rule could be characterized as follows. First, Put a utter extreme trust of the ruled people to the absolute ruler. Two, complete domination of justice, that is, just the distribution of goods and honors among the ruled people. And three, absolute power of the ruler who at will can mutilate, deform, kill, damage, etc. It is obvious that the philosophical power is unlimited. Apparently, the only condition of the ownership of the political science, which is implicitly identified with what we call today philosophy. The government is the only one which can guarantee the happiness of the community. In fact, the knowledge of the politician is the last and very foundation of happiness. The rule of philosopher is thus mediated through the will of the politician. And although until now the personality of the politicians has been estimated to the point, from the point of view of his wisdom, wisdom a very short passage reveals that his nature actually represents the ruling Superman's main quality.
<clears throat> I quote, but as the case now stands, since as we claim no king is produced in our states who is like the ruler of the bees in their hips, hives by birth preeminently fitted from the beginning in body and mind. We are obliged, as it seems, to follow in the track of the perfect and true form of government by coming together and making written laws. This is uh, here you have a brief representation of this passage. The, the characteristics of the true politician has to superior in body and in mind, uh, and not he, he does not exist today, and because of that, the rule of law without as the highest power is the only possible way of live together, or the best one at least. In this three and a half line, it becomes as clear as daylight that the qualities of the Uberman or Superman are referred not only to mind or intelligence, as we had probably understood Plato's position until now, but also to a bodily superiority, as the passage expresses. Furthermore, the analogy with the queen bee reveals what kind of personality the philosopher King has according to Plato. The nature of the queen bee is very different from the nature of normal bee. Philosopher politician is here represented with a clearly superhuman essence in essence in body and soul, a kind of Nietzschean government, even if Nietzsche don't put this, don't, does not stress it there, corporal characteristic, characteristics, who represents the counterpart of a superior man praised by colleagues in the Golgas. His conviction that personalities have ruled over human communities at the beginning of this historical period led Plato to look after the traces of their rule in the present, present social norms. Therefore, it also, also, led, it also led him to unconditionally defend their validity, the validity of existing laws or norms, social norms, what were better translation. This and only this is the reason of his fierce defense of the existing legislation and of his negative judgment of ever change. This attitude produces logically a certain rigidity in the laws with which he also criticizes. The subliminal message is, we urgently need such a man who deeply cleanses the existing laws and builds up a new order. Now the ambivalence of to the excuse me to the philosopher in the laws. And the laws, as you know, is the last dialogue, the last of Plato's dialogues, supposedly. A dialogical situation, the dialogical situation in the laws is completely different from the scene in the Republic. The problem addressed is also unlike the issue of happiness or unhappiness of the just man or the unjust one. Furthermore, the political system proposed for the new colony of Magnesia represents significant variant, variants. First of all, we should point to the existence of family property, not private ownership, as, some, as is sometimes supposed. We do not know whether the, the Republic, the race of the producers enjoys private ownership. 
Plato says nothing about this issue. Anyway, in the laws, there is no private ownership. The division of the citizens is also dissimilar. The race of producer is excluded from the citizenship and the citizens are land owners, but not farmers. The jetty has already pointed to the fact, again in the, his commentary of the Republic, that there is a clear difference between the task of the rulers in book five, four and five of the Republic and the mission of the philosopher king in books five and six. The latter rule and especially legislate. Although the philosophical, philosophers, philosophers king's job is not the same in the Republic, it is clearly that contrary to the normal guardians, they are beyond the law. The law. Normal guardians are not the legibus soluti, but as the rest of the city, they live under the rule excuse me, of law. In other words, the task of the philosopher focuses in, on the normative construction of the state. The, struct, the structure of the Cretan colony, Magnesia, is very different from Calipolis arrangement. In the former, the figure of the philosopher is not the pillar on which the political system is built up, but the basis of is the legal and administrative organization of the state as such. Everybody is under the rule of law. The problem is the problem which in the, the dialogue Try, tries to solve is how a city which is created in normal circumstances and has no philosopher at its disposal can gradually become a city under philosophical gui guidance. The Athenian's proposal lays the foundation for that in the future. But philosophical guidance, I do not mean philosophical government. Athenians project corresponds, as I have already tried to demonstrate somewhere else, to the situation described in the statement when the philosopher represents a state project in which he does not participate or in the world of the dialogue when the philosopher is not present. However, there is an institution and that is why I would say that this if it is the laws are states in theory, which stands above the nocturnal count, they are above of the of, of the city. The most important nocturnal council. From the political point of view, it has the same function function as the philosopher king. However, it does not exercise does not exercise the absolute power over the rest of the community. Nevertheless, the main difference is in the way the power is exercised, the absolute monarch, monarch has now disappeared. The nocturnal council is a collegial institution which assumes the function of changing the existing laws, abol abolishing others and introducing new ones. Even if it is not expressly say how a decision must be taken, we can logical assume, look, logically assume that there are, that they were expressly said how um, that they ta were taken through consultation and consensus. But above all, they might not change the existing constitution radically, as it is expressly stated in the passage of the eighth book. The future legislation says the Athenian guest must adhere to the principle given by the first one. Even if the nocturnal council should include, could include one or several members who could be considered philosophers, there is no absolute ruler in the sense of the Republic or the statement. It is very significant that the verb basilewain of course, only three times and always in the in an historical context of the third book. There is still a detail 
which should be no other scene, namely that no member of the nocturnal council is a philosopher at the beginning. Only the unanswered question of the co-optation of the Athenian guest could be interpreted as an allusion to, in this direction. A well-known passage in the fifth book clarifies the position that Plato has conceived for the philosopher as for the philosopher in this project. And, uh, as a as advisor. And, uh, today we, we would say as consultant. Yeah? The next move, I quote, in our setting of the laws is one that my at first hearing cause at first hearing cause surprise. because of its un unusual character. Like the move of a drotter player who quits his sacred line, nonetheless, it will be clear to him who reasons it out and uses experience that the state will probably have a constitution no higher than a second in point of excellence. Probably, one, one might refuse to accept this owing to the unfamiliarity with law builders who are not also discussed, this part. But it is in fact the most current plan to describe the best polity and the second best and the third and after describe them, describing them to give the choice to the individual who is charged with the founding of the settlement. This passage allows not only to see the different possibilities of action of a philosopher, of action the philosopher has in a political project, that is to present to the politician different projects, a different a difference to the Republic, which several scholars have already stressed. Much more significant for our present issue is the fact that the philosopher ruler now does not reign as eleven, but has become a tyrant, tyrannon. In this project, the law takes on the position of the tyrant. In a very well-known passage of the non-named book of the laws, you have a no, uh, 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 874, 7, until 875, T1. The Athenian guest raises the question whether knowledge alone is enough for enacting and leading a philosophical and autocratic rule. The answer is clearly negative, even if someone could thoroughly learn the art of learning, he could not exercise absolute power without placing his private interest above the interest of the community. This passage shows again the importance of physics. I have tried to stress before. Knowledge alone is not enough. The result would, would be the utter destruction of the polis. The main condition for such a government is the emergence of a divine nature through divine intervention. If such a man would be able to seize the power, he would not need laws which rule over him. A potetis anthropon susei canosteia moira genetes, paralebein pinatos eien, the nomon udain deutotel would not meet any law who rules over him. As you see, the image of an over man is always present. In the world, 
non paper moral 1940-54 related the demurge of the Timaeus to the philosopher legislator of legislator. In the statement, Plato treats the topic of the relation between politician and God. The center of the dialogue in the so-called Ophalos, the guest of Ilea narrates a myth which must clear the difference between the direct rule of the gods of the human blocks and the rule of the human politician. The main point is that the rule of the human politician is an image of or imitation of the divine rule. There is no difference between the present politician and normal humans concerning the nature and education. You see the next quotation. I quote, I think, Socrates, that, <clears throat> that the form of the divine shepherd is greater than that of the king. Whereas the statesmen who know, who now exist here are by nature much more like their subjects with whom they share much more nearly the same breeding and education. The affected politician here are the contemporary politicians. The philosopher politician is excluded from this comparison since his own the superior, a superior level. I have already demonstrated as I have already demonstrated. In fact, in fact, the true politician has another nature and as such, he does not belong to the human level. The draws in the same passage of the fifth book I have stated before. The Athenian guest characterizes the inhabitants of the best city as God, a children and children of God. I quote. Okay, excuse me. In such a state, be it God or son of God that dwell in it, they dwell pleasantly, living such a life as this. This is, a, this is a state of absolute communism. Wherefore, one should, or without the private property, wherefore, one should not look elsewhere for a model of constitution, a model constitution, but hold fast to this one, and with all one's power, seek the constitution that is like as like to it as possible. It is obvious that Plato is here thinking of a city settled by philosopher, and that this has a nature superior to the human character. Several passages in the law show that the Plato has not changed his position concerning the philosopher rule. Furthermore, the philosopher's superhuman nature is expressed more clearly. At one point of the fourth, fourth book, when the Athenian guest specifies the conditions of the existence of a perfect state, he proclaims the divine ruler, the nature of the ruler. I quote, excuse me. Whenever a heaven sent desire for temperate and just institutions arises in those who hold high position, whether as monarch, or because as conspicuous eminence of wealth or birth, or happily, happily as displaying uh, the character of Nestor, of whom it is said that while he surpassed all men in the force of his eloquence, still more did he surpass heavily them in temperance. That was, as they say, 
the Troya age, certainly not in our time, time, still, if any such man existed or shall, shall exist, or exist the man as now, blessed is the life he leads, and blessed are they who join in listening to the words of temperance that proceed out of his mouth. So likewise of power in general, the same rule holds good. Whenever the greatest power coincides, coincides by in man with wisdom and temperance, then the germ of the best quality is planted, but in no other way is, will be it ever come above. It is noteworthy that in all this passage, which analyzes this, all the possibilities of changing an existing political regime, in the best possible state, democracy is not mentioned. However, my intention is to stress the significance of Nestor, a hero, a superman between gods and humans, an excellent nature, much better than the usual human character, character put with the maximum ability of persuasion, is the only way to which philosophy and political power can coincide. Here, the ideal of the Republic is clearly represented by an overman sent by divine de determination. Much more important is it that the philosopher is conceived as a divinity. We can also observe the divinization of his listeners. They are makarioi, blessed, an adjective which is properly applied only to the gods. Something similar happens with the dead philosophers in the Republic. To become a philosopher is to become a god, as the Athenian proclaims another passage which is usually interpreted in a wrong way. The Athenian guests answer the question posed by Plinius concerning what kind of mathematical subject Uh, concerning the, what kind of mathematic, mathematical subject the citizens of Magnesia should learn. And said the Athenian, I think, of course, those subjects without which one would never come become a god, a demon, or a hero able to care seriously for mankind. If the, if he does not practice and learn them. The philosophical praxis allows the ruler to become a god or a divine being, which like the queen bee is substantially different from the rest of human being. In Plato's work, it is possible to find practically everywhere the divinization of the philosopher which, however, is only the consequence of the absolute rule of the divine principle, the mind over the mortal kinds of soul. And now the relationship, the philosopher, the, of the philosopher politician with the tyrant. The analogy between the man and city, which Socrates presents in the Republic, has important consequences for politics, because it lets the preservation or destruction of the state depend of a man sent by God. For good or for evil, they are personalities which stand beyond normal men. Extreme good and extreme evil are completely depending of them, on them. The fate of the states rests on their shoulder. <clears throat> there is a very interesting aspect of the philosophical change or, or the philosophical rule. It is um, necessary a minimal change 
which is the precondition for the construction of the perfect state. This is next, it seems, we must try to discover and point out what it is that is now badly managed in our city and that prevents them from being so governed. That what is the smallest change that will bring a state into this manner of government, preferably a change of one thing, if not then in two, and failing that, the fewest possible in number and the slightest importance. However, this minimal change is not easily feasible. Even if a ruler with the knowledge of the practically practical capacity, capacity seize the power and enacts the philosophical state, it is not guaranteed that the people will accept it easily. As I have pointed out above, the Republic is structured on the base of the contradiction between the philosopher and the tyrant, while the former represents the absolute dominion of mind, the latter implies, as the Abe and Neil books describe, the coronation of the lowest kind of soul. The covalent soul, so epitometicon, is actually a chaotic and contradictory multiplicity which stands in opposition to the unit, unity of mind. On a social level, this opposition expresses itself in the contradiction philosopher King Mass. On the wise, to the wise ruler sent by the gods and God in himself who knows the unity and the common good opposes the ignorant, ignorant mode interested only in their particular good, particular good and with thousands of different and opposed desires. Politically, the rule of the tyrant is still worse because it expresses the infinite desires and passion of the lower part of the soul. It is strange that Plato has always left open the possibility of changing the tyranny in the philosophical rule in spite of his view. This possibility is not only always present, but if you take into account some passages of the Republic or the laws, it also is considered to be the most practicable. I have already mentioned the possibility of the conversion of kings or rulers. Vegetti has already remarked that in the Republic, it was impossible to mention the tyranny due to the subject of the, in the polemic against the tyrant. However, the tyrant and the tyranny are the easiest way to change the political system into the best one is expressed in the laws. A young tyrant's gift with the virtues is the fastest and best way of connecting the best, enacting, excuse me, the best state. I quote, that our monarchs then possess this natural quality, temperance is referring to Safrosine, in addition to the other qualities mentioned, is the state is to acquire in the quickest and best way possible the constitution it needs for the happiest life, kind of life, for there does not exist, not, nor could there ever arise a quicker and better form of constitution than this. There are another passages that point in the same direction. In the, quest, in the quotation of the fifth book of the law I have already mentioned, the Athenian guest speaks also of the philosopher tyrant. This view of the philosopher tyrant, or if you like, of the legislator tyrant, occurs also in other passages of the laws. This is perhaps the consequences of his conviction that the tyrant owns a superior nature above the mark 
and that persuasion would change his mind if he is not utterly rotten. I am very skeptical about the biographical interpretation about biographical interpretation, but we could dream or rather speculate that this would give an explanation of his insistence in Syracuse. They to think of the persuasion as the of the smallest circle of power, the way in which he speaks shows that he considers this method an actual existing possibility. As several testimonies from Articusus shows, it seems that the persuasion of absolute rulers was a real tendency among the Athenians, Athenian intellectual circles, excuse me. Xenophon's hero, where the where the po poets Simonides and the tyrant dialogue about the tyrants and the normal man's life shows that the Socratic circles in the so that the, in the Socratic circles the possibility of persuading tyrants to adopt a political agenda was discussed at least theoretically. They aspire aspired to become advisors of the of the tyrant. And Plato adopts this position clearly in the laws. However, he makes this possibility still more radical insofar as he considers the possibility of seizing power by the philosophers as the best solution. This succinct indication I have not mentioned here, PG, I, I, Socrates are enough to show that the classical Greek, uh, the classical Greek has already gone, we don't really know if they open, the path of intellectuals seduced by power, especially by the God sent man, who is supposed to wish the best for everybody. And this way, intellectuals became and become accomplices of crime, the murder of freedom. Through these and other good intentions, they have often, often understood political systems, which are enemies of freedom, as a way of educating people for getting a supposed common happiness. And many still more times they were seduced by a uh, logos, a discourse of justice for everybody, abolishing freedom. Good. Actually, but now I, I will say, after this long navigation through Plato's sex, we barely have time to analyze the historical evolution of these ideas. I shall now briefly allude to Nietzsche's relation to Plato. Unfortunately, I can offer the tale overview of Plato's influence through Nietzsche. Several scholars have lately pointed not only the significance of Nietzsche's political thought, but in particular to Plato's impact on Nietzsche. Contrary to the usual image, Nietzsche has seen in Plato's political thought the source of inspiration as the fragment of the Greek state shows. I would like to focus on Nietzsche's conception of the, of the overman, superman, or übermensch. Plato's influence of Nietzsche's conception of the overman and even on his language cannot be detailed here, but I would like to point only to one passage referred by Plato to the relationship between soul and body, but which can be applied to the whole of his political theory. At the beginning of the fifth book of the laws, the Athenian guest says, the stronger and better are the ruling elements, the weaker and worse, those that serve, 
Wherefore, of one's own belongings, one must honor those that rule above other self, those that self, excuse me. This text points to the essence of Plato's political thought. The relationship between master and slave as organizer center, which eradicates all forms of human relation. Something strongly criticized by Aristotle. These conceptions put, put all the weight on the superior element, while the inferior one only has to obey. We have seen how carefully Plato described the qualities of the superior man, being human being, excuse me, should possess. Nietzsche is not so sender in the personal qualities of the overman. In fact, the overman is a goal. It's a goal, an ever-changing goal that cannot be, uh, that cannot be a continuous overcoming, which cannot be completely defined. This points to a central difference between Nietzsche and Plato. Nietzsche adopts one theme of the Greek tradition, the rivalry between man and God. And in, and in his soul, so spoke Zarathustra in the last speech from the Schenken, Goethe, so spoke. He says, Zarathustra concludes, uh, of the first part, Zarathustra concludes that all gods are dead. Dort sind alle Götter, nun wollen wir, dass der Übermensch leben. Dead are all gods. Now we want the Superman to live. For Plato, on the contrary, the philosopher and the philosopher kings were, were in this world to have their gods and assuring their order and rule over mankind, even if the concept mankind is not strictly platonic, as, as I shall explain later. While Plato's philosopher king is the best server of the community and the state, Nietzsche has inverted the relationship, converting the superhuman or genius and the goal of the states and the purpose of the community. In this point, he is nearer to Calicles than to Plato, in a kind of Hegelian dialectic where the arbitrariness of the Caliclean ruler is denied. Of, uh, by the philosopher King and abolish of the home by Nietzsche's idea of genius, abolish or of overcome, difficult translation. This is German word. For Plato, the community is the goal, while for Nietzsche, the goal is the overman, the only being that is actually free. The rest are only slaves at his service. For Plato, even if the rest of the community is only slave in the sense that they must obey, obey the overman is only a mediator between the order of God. In spite uh, in order of God and the human community, excuse me, I have to speak the, the time, excuse me, it's a bit long. In spite of this, his statement, Nietzsche likes Plato considers the Uberman to be a God, the manifestation of a God on the earth and philosopher God, yes, beyond good and evil, in terms of which they are very similar to Plato. However, it is certain that Nietzsche's belief in the Overman is the result of his reading of Plato's dialogue under a highly 
important influence, namely Christianity. In fact, his message is a universal message and that is not Plato's case. Plato's political projects are directed to Greek police. That does not mean that his message can have universal value to us. However, Plato did not conceive his reality as universally valid for all people, something which is clearly believed to be true. Plato was very reluctant about with writing just because a written work can be read by everyone. And the master must speak only to those who are up to listen. Nietzsche printed, he said, and aspired to a general acknowledgement. Those spoke Zarathustra is precisely a kind of anti-gospel, but a kind, in any case, a gospel. In fact, he defines Zarathustra as, I quote, a higher kind of human, half saint, half genius, and a heron art mensch of Helga and half Jenny and Eche Omo. A clear characterization where the Christian element occurs. Furthermore, for Plato, persuasion was central to a central part of his political project, not, not so for Nietzsche. Even this persuasion, even this case, this can appear contradictory, but the contradiction is not in the fact. Ergois, which in the case of Nietzsche are clear, he wanted to impose a reign where the overman rule over the slave, with the, even, even with violence. The consequences of this ideology are well known. There is also some contradiction between the isolation Nietzsche considers the normal situation of to the overman and his position as social goal. Nietzsche stresses the contradiction between the overman and the masses grow. Isolation from the people and contradiction are points very different from Plato's approach. The Athenian does not see the philosopher always acting as in group and in friendship and as good shepherd in human flocks. It is impossible for Plato to become, become a philosopher in isolation. However, I think it is nature reading of Plato what that produced the influence of the Athenian in the totalitarian movement in the 20th century. Apparently, there is a certain historical continuity in the theoretical philosophy concerning the contraposition between the crow and the exceptional personality. Probably, this probably this idea of killing. I am not sure which term would be more appropriate here, is prehuman and related to the phenomenon of leadership. Nietzsche adopt, adopts Plato's image of Calicles. Both Plato and Nietzsche maintain the existence of exceptional personality. However, However, Plato believed that these personalities were sent by gods in order to act as benefactors of a concrete community. Only Greeks would be philosopher or and servants of the community, since the last goal was for him the unity and preservation of the community, the negation of the individuality by all means. Nietzsche, on the contrary, considered the exceptional personality, the purpose and goal of every community. And in this sense, it is Calician since the community must be at his, at his service. I do not want to abuse of your passions and therefore I saw only point to the fact that the different reading is also possible in which the difference within between both thinkers, I have point two are also not so great. In a very, very well-documented research, Helen Roche analyzed the effects of Sparta ideology, ideology on German military sixth thought. This influence could certainly be extended to other, a better perhaps to all European countries, especially to England, I think, usually 
forgotten by English scholars. I know something about the Sparta perception in the old German Democratic Republic, just to the same case, which could be supposed to have an opposite position. There, as in the rest of the East Bloc, existed a strong admiration for the so called egalitarian Sparta. Our present image of the Mirage Spartier, using the title of a famous book, is the product of the Attic circles, the Lakonov Isles, long for uh, what they consider to be a social and political system contrary, contrary to the chaotic functioning of democracy. Plato has played a central role in the construction of this idealized image of the militaristic Sparta. Also, in this book about the Spartan Fata Morgana or Yer, does not pay him the attention he deserves. His position is very seductive just today, where the menace, menace of so called populism grows up, and also the incompetence of the present, present politicians is blatant, and they do not give the necessary answers to the dangers of our civilization must face. In America, the voices arguing against democracy are multiplying again, and there are proposals for the so called epistemocracy, as if that is a political system based again and again and again on knowledge. Democracy, in particular, present democracy, has many faults, and the idea of a technocratic government, as Brennan proposed in his book, against democracy could be very sedative, especially when we, after a discussion with our neighbor, or better with our brother-in-law, remember the same attributed to Winston Churchill, the best, I quote, <coughs> the best argument against democracy is a five minute, minute conversations with the average voter. However, in my view, Democracy has two advantages. One comes from Plato. It is the political system that warrants the most possible broadest freedoms, especially individual freedom. The other comes from Ludwig von Mises. And this is perhaps still more important. Namely, it is a system which permits to change government without violence, even if today many people are, are putting with sublimation, this um, question. The uh, identifi um, I'm finishing. Oh, yeah. The identification between law and the philosopher King's will, i.e., the intention to found the social norms on true and eternal ontological principle, has a consequence that politics and dissent are actually eliminated. Consensus in the community is no longer necessary. The law as will of the ruler becomes the main power in society. Plato solves the tension between law, recht, right, and politics through the submission of the later to the former. The, for Plato, there is no contradiction between power and law. This is the law when it is right, coincides with the politicians will and so has a value beyond politics. Other people, I've already pointed to the consequences of such a theory. I could sure it could surely be objected that philosopher King is an extraordinary figure, figure that only longs for the common good. Plato's restrictions change nothing in the fact that the fact that the difference between the tyrant and the philosopher King is blurred, blurred as it happened in Socrates, Socratic circles or in Machiavelli. Another example can also be poly the polemic between Strauss and Koyev, um, defender of the tyranny. Koyev, as it's known, is, was a member of the KGB, of the Russian KGB, is his admirer of Stalin. Koyev's interpretation, namely, that the philosopher strives for a modern a new universal state and that only tyrants can give the fundamental step in this direction. As Strauss, demonstrated this conception goes against the essence of human beings.
That's all. Thank you. Excuse me again for the long speech. That's perfectly fine. Thank you very much, Professor Lucy. Um, it's been a great listening to you. A very thorough, very detailed speech. Yeah. Um, now we can have questions. So those who are watching us, if you'd like to raise a question, you can type it on the YouTube. Um, and from there, I would be able to read them to you. Excuse uh, me, I, I take my hearers because... Uh, I'm not sure, yes, of course. No. Okay, not possible. <laughs> not <a> computer. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, your uh, a colleague, uh, I think, and a friend of yours uh, says hello, uh, Professor Manuel uh, Knoll. Uh, no, yes, of course. It's, yes, it's, uh, says great hello. Friend, yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So, I mean, right now I'm waiting for the questions on YouTube and. Uh, Professor Manuel Knoll has a question and a comment. Um, so I'm going to perhaps wait, or maybe as he types his question, I can make a very brief comment about uh, like one of the advantages of the democracy being perhaps the freedom of speech that is yeah. allowed to members of the community. Uh, give them a chance to, uh, since it gives them a chance to speak their minds, it in a way prevents the pressure that might otherwise build up from not being able to speak one's voice, right? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a, almost a, a decompressor, so to speak, if the analogy is right, yes. uh, right? Yes, I agree, I agree. I, I think it's, uh, freedom of speech is the fundamental uh, right, not only right, it's a fundamental basis of democracy. Yeah. But freedom of speech means also rationality and eh? uh, refusing violence, every kind of violence, yes. and accepting different opinions in order to have a, a rational dialogue. This is yes. the most important, and I think this is the thing that today we have a big danger against our democratic, well, at least in Europe, uh, uh, democratic systems, because there are also, there is not only, there are not only tyrants, there are only, also, I could say, logoi discourses that are really uh, um, speaking loud about justice, but trying to abolish real freedom. This is a, a big danger, I think. Yes. And also, uh, the, yeah. Um, so I will be reading the question now and I can also type it. Uh, Mr. Manuel Knoll says, Professor Knoll says, Plato claims in the Republic that he cares about the happiness of all citizens. Yeah. But Nietzsche claims that Plato only cares about the Olympic existences Yes. and sees all the other citizens just as means for those genius. Would you agree with Nietzsche's interpretation? Yes, I would say that yes, this is true that Plato claims that this is happening. This is always the same, uh, not only Plato, everybody claims also they are looking for the happiness of the community. But in, in as a matter of fact, I. It has a uh, right understand the, the question. As a matter of fact, Plato, I, I have also pointed to the fact that they, they are not so different because for Plato, it's the community apparently the goal. But the, really, to be a really human, you have to be a philosopher. Hmm. There is no difference with Nietzsche's approach. As, of course, uh, 
Street also in the politi- in the statesman of politi- politicals is also very clear the philosopher King Kant may apply every every kind of uh, coaction against the rural people because this is for the for the good good of a, but this is a very dangerous approach I would say. Yeah. Uh, and he also has a comment, Manuel's comment is, uh, he says, you claim that Thrasymachos does not support tyranny as best form of government. And he says, I'm not sure whether this is true. Um, yeah. And I will copy paste it also just to make sure that I... Mm-hmm. Should I read it again? No, no, not yet. Okay. Wait a minute, we have a moment. Uh, uh. Uh, you have sent that uh, through chats or? Oh, sorry, yes, um, I will. Yeah, but the chat is not here. If you, if you send it to me through a chat, I can see it. Okay, and I will. Marmara University. The only problem is that it's Marmara University, not you. Oh, okay. ah, here, here, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yes. Yeah, no, no, no. You claim that the Simon Post does not support you. Ah, yeah. Uh, no, I not claim that because it's not possible to state what the Simon Post really thought because we have only very few fragments, but we have a relative uh, long fragment where he is speaking in favor of democracy. I think he has more, and he was also active in in Athens at the time where Protagoras was very important. And I think we have, uh, we believe too much what Plato said, of course. Protagoras approach is very dangerous. Uh, Manuel goes on uh, to yeah, say- yeah, Manuel, yeah, the most, yes, yes, I'm, yes, of course. The form of government, the rule is only care for particular interests, yes, of course. I would say many people there. And uh, that does not mean that he was necessarily to be May I? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I tapped him. Because he is the most unjust and takes for him what he wants. Well, this is his Plato's. Excuse me. So let me, in the meanwhile, perhaps but read I, the I, I whole get, thing. This is his Plato's version of the Shemakas. This is what Plato oh. said. And this can be the conclusion of. Plato takes, uh, for instance, in the Theatrus, Plato's version of Protagoras, even if Plato takes a lot of things from Protagoras, apparently, because also Protagoras is very, very um, an unknown dimension. Uh, even in this case, it's very difficult to say Tassimaco thought that Plato puts these words on the similar. I'm not sure about that, about this, what I have points in another direction, but I cannot affirm that surely that is not, uh, that is the similar uh, position is defender of tyranny. I think it would be very difficult. Yes, of course, I know, I know that. Now. Uh, this is not the point. This is what Plato said, or the Plato's, the words Plato puts in my Simacos mood. No, but let not the real fragments do not allow, I would say, to be so conscious about the Simacos. I don't know if Manuel, you are hearing me. Yes, I hope. Listen. Yes, I can hear you. 
Uh, he's on YouTube, and I, what I'm doing is I'm typing his comments, um, okay. copy pasting yeah. them here. So he's hearing you. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says yes. I exactly. I am talking only about Plato's Thrasymachus. In fact, in fact, I, I don't know. Perhaps the consequences of Thrasymachus thinking is that just that. But I think it was very difficult in Athens where Tarsimachus were very actively in this time to defend the, the personality of a tyrant, at least openly. This is the point where I find the normal uh, interpretation of Tarsimachus a bit suspect. I cannot, I cannot be, con I don't know. I cannot and I will not be conclusive about that. Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, I agree. I agree. Ah, you are, uh, yeah, okay. It's not sense that I write something. I agree with that, what he, say, uh, he says at, uh, at the end. Yeah, he, um, because the audience, uh, oh, actually the audience would see his messages too. So uh, in a, for a moment, I thought I needed to repeat uh, what he has mm -hmm. written, but of course the audience on, being on YouTube is also seeing these messages. Yeah, this is the first time when I'm using Zoom. I, do. I am American <laughs> and I don't need to have <laughs> seminars <laughs> in, in times of, of pandemia. <laughs> um, okay, let's see if there are any other questions. And he's definitely, I mean, he's listening. He's, you were asking before, but he's there live listening. <laughs> Um, okay, um, all right, so for the moment there's no other question and as we wait we have just uh, like uh, 10 minutes or so still, okay. so maybe some people are still typing their uh, questions. Um, I want to ask a more kind of a, uh, a general question uh, concerning um, the concept of this philosopher king uh, would you think that's more suited for the kind of community envisioned by perhaps Hobbes or by Rousseau? So in Hobbes, of course, we have the mankind and the state of nature of mankind is somewhat wicked and evil, that every man is selfish and after his own interests. Whereas in Rousseau, you have a much uh, kinder community, I guess where people think about other people's kindness. So um, in comparison, uh, would you think that the concept of the philosopher king is more suited perhaps for the Rousseau community as opposed to Hobbesian? Yeah, it's difficult to say. I, I, I don't like very much these uh, generalizations about the, it depends probably from the genetics, but, characteristic of every community. I don't think that you can state very conclusively man, as of mankind is selfish or uh, altruist. It's not sure. I think one, one very important thing we have forgotten is that we are animals. Huh. And if you observe animals in animals, you find both things selfishness and altruism. And that is uh, every human being is very particular and the function of education should be to guide people to have a first, um, and this is the first of all in democracy, respect of the law, also for your rulers. And secondly, uh, um, a strong moral, and strong moral is not to have some, uh, um, some, uh, what is, some values that are not so important, but those what needs this and uh, uh, Alephia, this is truth. This is uh, to have always a behavior. This is much more important. This could be done. Than with uh, with education, 
even if it's impos impossible, I think, to eradicate everything and to have people that are like gods. They are not like gods, unfortunately. <laughs> or I don't know if unfortunately or fortunately, because it <laughs> 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 would be very, very problematic. <laughs> I know. Um, oh, there's another question uh, from Professor Ardal Yulmaz. Uh, he says, okay, as far as I know, Nietzsche's expression, will to power, has an artistic implication and political implication. Uh, do those two implications support each other in Nietzsche's thought? Is there any relation between them? I think I, will to power is um, political or an uh, artistic implication and a political implication. So. Yes, I now uh, copy pasted it as well in case you want to. Is there are two implications about each other. As far as I know, Nietzsche's expression will to power as an artistic implication. Yes, okay, I report us. The case of Nietzsche, I do, I'm not sure if Nietzsche really intended to have a political projection in the sense with gift to political. Uh, probably the idea of an um, artistic implication is much more important for him than the other one because he was uh, very related to himself. Now, I don't, I think this is, um, and I think, I, I don't think, I don't think that's the, that's politics and artics. But good, if you take the, the, the idea, the artistic idea of genius, you could say, that the political, they were uh, both related, political and artistic. But uh, it is not necessary to think, for instance, that the uh, semi, semi half cut is the hero, the, the new, the leader, the political leader necessarily has to be a genius in an artistic sense. I don't know, probably not. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are almost out of time, actually. Um, okay. Our audience is, members of our audience is thanking you. Um, thank you, thank for you very much. comprehensive talk. And um, yeah. so I also thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. For your comments and answers as well. Um, so, we are hopefully going to have another talk uh, in June uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, oh, yeah. Good, you just sent me the information. I'll try to, to get time to for looking yes. at the room. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. So to members of our audience as well, thank you for joining us. Um, okay. And uh, we hope to see you uh, again, okay. in our next talk, this the, the announcements are made uh, on uh, social media, the Twitter account of Marmara, and we're also sending out the information. Thank you very much. I, I prefer if you send to me uh, an email. I don't use social media. Yeah, neither do I, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like so, it. Yeah. I don't like the, it's my email. Brother, I don't like the big brother. <laughs> Political, so we, I do think things are not right, but it's not in democracy also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, till the next time, yes? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Till next time. And everyone else, uh, have a nice weekend. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank Bye. you.